Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Blog. This is episode 65, and I figured before we get into Carnage Week, um, I would do one more video for Venom, uh, just to give you guys something, uh, and I thought we would dig deeper into his backstory. And I've been talking about this trade paperback called um, the, the Dark Origin for a while now, and I thought, you know what, this will be a pretty good one, because we're going to pretty much be making Carnage videos all week. In fact, I've already recorded like three or four of them now. I think three of them. Um, so that way I have some for the first couple days. And I did change the format. So that little teaser I put out like a week ago or so where it said what we're going to talk about each day, it's going to change up a little bit. I'm not going to do exactly that. I just realized as I was reading through this, there's a ton of content. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do one week of carnage. I'll get through as much story as I can with some of the, you know, the trade paperbacks that I have, and then we'll save some more carnage stuff for later. Uh, and then now that we've introduced them into the show we can you know always do an episode on carnage later on so that's that's kind of how i'm going to format this so it's going to be a little different uh, but we'll talk more about that at the end of the episode what i want to dive into right now is i have my my kindle here and i have the trade paperback of dark origin just to kind of give me because you know i don't script my shows i kind of just talk and ramble and so i figured having it here you know available would be good for me so that way i could you know just jump to it if i need to for you guys uh, but dark origin it was written by zeb wells and uh, it's it's just a really great take on uh, on Venom. In fact, it actually takes all the stories that have happened before and weaves them into um, a, a very cohesive miniseries. I would say um, if anyone out there is is a fan of Venom and they want to get into the character and they want like a like the beginning of the character, I would say obviously read the original David Michelini Amazing Spider-Man issue 300. Pick up Birth of Venom. Pick up that trade and then pick up Dark Origin, just back to back. If you read them in that order, Birth of Venom and then Dark Origin, you'll see a lot of cool stuff. You'll see every little Easter egg and every little tie that you know Zeb Wells wanted to do, every little bow he wanted to put on any thread that was left over, he put it all in this five issue series. And, uh, and it's fantastic, it's really, really great. Um, and I believe, I can't remember his name, uh, it's, his last name is Medina, um, and uh, Angel Medina. Angel Medina does the artwork, and Angel was a, an artist at Marvel. I think still draws comics and stuff, but uh, when I first came across, Angel was during this time in Spider-Man comics in the like mid-2000s, and uh, and his art was amazing. He has kind of a Todd McFarlane-y kind of style. I'm sure Todd McFarlane was probably an influence on him and on his art style, uh, and you'll see as I post some of the covers up here, you'll probably get a glimpse of some of his art and stuff, uh, but uh, the book opens and it's Eddie Brock as a kid. He's like maybe eight or 10 years old, and there's a girl down the street, he kind of likes her, but she doesn't really notice him. So, um, you know, he's just, he's like, I guess his like sister makes a comment like, hey, you're wearing your church clothes. You, you shouldn't be in your church clothes. So again, setting up the, you know, the Catholic background for Eddie. And, uh, and he's like, you know, basically uh, walking, he like sees the girl, she's like, my cat's missing, my cat's missing. He comes home, his sister yells at him for wearing his church clothes. He rolls up his sleeves and you see these claw marks on his sleeves. And you're like, what's going on? And then he has a box in his in his garage or in the basement and uh, like it's moving around. And he takes a like a serious stack of books off of it, opens it up and the cat is there. Um, and he, you know, he picks it up, rolls the sleeves back down, brings the cat back to the girl and is like, here you go, here's your, here's your cat. And she's like, thank you, Eddie, you're the best, you're the best. And, uh, and this, you know, nearby adult is like hey eddie good job like your dad will be really proud of you and eddie's kind of like yeah i maybe you know kind of like uh still setting up again that the fact that eddie really never got approval from his father and we see it as back as you know this age as far back as you know eight to ten years old uh, and we learn why because after eddie does this and the girl's like how did you find the cat he's like it was easy you know um that is a thread and a line that comes back numerous times in this story. Every time Eddie gets ahead in life by doing something kind of morally wrong, um, that's kind of what he falls back on. Is it's easy, and it's just it's easy to do it. It's easier this way. Um, it's easier to cut corners, and that's kind of what Eddie is. It's easier to, to make myself the hero. And uh, when he comes home, his dad's like, you know, you know, they're they're sitting at dinner, him, his sister, and his dad, and. Uh, and they're talking about um, their mother. And you find out that actually Eddie Brock's mom died giving birth to Eddie. And his sister says some horrible things about that. She says, you know, like, you're the reason mom died. Uh, and of course, Eddie's like, you know, takes that personally. And his dad's like, oh, honey, it's, it's not, you know, that's not true. Don't say that to your brother. 
you know, it was just your mom's time to go, you know, kind of thing. It's, it's not Eddie's fault. Um, but then his dad leaves and Eddie goes, yeah, I can tell when people are lying because Eddie is at this point already like an established liar and he's really good at it at the age of like 10 years old. So he, he, can, he tells his sister, he's like, she's like, what are you so mad about? Dad just defended you. And she, he's like, yeah, but he was lying. Like uh, he doesn't believe that it's not my fault. And that is the thing that comes through. Like Eddie watches the Watergate scandal um, on TV with his dad, and he and he says, "Hey, I know that guy's lying. Like there was a guy giving a testimony, and he's like, I'll tell everything I need to, you know, tell about the about Watergate." And Eddie goes, "No, he's lying. He's lying." And then later on, it comes out he was lying, and his dad it was like the one time his dad gave him a compliment was like, you know, journalism is something maybe to look into because you know journalists have to tell the truth. Um, and uh, and they have to get to the truth. And so Eddie is like, oh, my dad, that impresses my dad. So I, I just want him to love me because obviously he blames me for my mom's death, even though he says he doesn't. Um, and uh, and I want to impress him. I want to win his approval. And so that's what Eddie's journey is through this whole book. It's a really personal story. It's something that I hope comes up in the movie, but probably not. I feel like this is sequel material. This is something when, you know, when you make your first movie, you just want to establish the character, give, give enough about him, uh, make him sympathetic. And then in the second movie, maybe go back into his childhood. And, and seeing this was really heartbreaking, knowing that his mom, you know, passed away in this in this way and uh, and learning, you know, how broken he is and how everything he does is he's just trying to be accepted by somebody, his dad, his sister, the girl down the street with the cat. And that carries into his teenage years when he goes to school. You know, at this point, he's lying about everything. He's he's telling people, uh, you know, this. he sees the girl and he's like, see me, please notice me, please notice me. And she doesn't notice him. So he takes like, a, you know, a jacket from like one of the sports uh, teams at, at his school. And he's like, hey, look, I'm on the team. And she's like, he's like, are you cheerleading today? Maybe I'll see you. And she's like, yeah, OK, Eddie, whatever. And then she leaves um, and, uh, and he goes and, you know, he tries to do the same trick again. He steals her pom-pom and then brings it back to her and she's like yeah I noticed it was missing but you know they just give them to us for free it's no big deal so you see he's still trying to win that approval still trying to pull the same tricks and uh, and they're not working so he's like all right what can I do now and um, and so he's still keeping in the back of his head I want to be a journalist I, I want to do the thing that will impress my dad I know it'll impress my dad so that's what I want to do and uh, and so he is keeping that in the back of his head but he's also you know, starting to get into sports, even though he's not really on the sports team. He's just like the guy who cleans their clothes and does their laundry. Uh, but he's, you know, just trying to look tough around them and try to look like he's part of them and things like that. And he's using that as a facade to try to, you know, get the girl he likes. And he's just having a terrible time. Uh, and then even to the point where he, he gets really slimy and really disgusting as a, as a human being when he is now in college. And he's, you know, pursuing journalism and stuff. And he's at this point he started to work out a little bit more. And he's, he's, you know, trying to impress his father in that way with like physical stuff. Because we talked about how he was a brainy kid in the birth of Venom. And then in his teenage years, he started to, you know, get into sports and try to play sports and beef up and hoping that would impress his dad. So he now he's gone through all that. So Zeb Wells did a really great job, like tying all those threads in while still telling, you know, a really interesting story here where Eddie uh, is with this girl. He meets Ann Weying, his wife, the woman who will be his wife and he meets her and he's like hey you know I'm lost I'm on campus because he basically Eddie was lying he says he goes to the dean and he says hey I have journalist background and they're like well he's like well I called your source and you know they they did you know it was like a dead number or something like that and he's like oh weird he's like well maybe it's this you know this number and the guy's like all right I'll try it in a little bit whatever so Eddie runs across campus to the payphone of the number that he gave to the to the dean and and he's waiting by the payphone to try to answer it and, and be like yes you know I'm, I'm Eddie Brown Brock's reference, you know, he was basically lying again. Uh, but when he gets to the phone, he he runs into some other people, uh, these tough guys, and they start pushing him around. And then he's like, hey, hey, and this Ann Wang steps in to be like, hey, what's going on here? And Eddie's like, hey, I'm sorry, I'm like lost, and I'm, I just wanted to use the phone, and I, I live off campus, and I, you know, I, you, would you mind helping me get there? And she's kind of like creeped out by him. He's like, please, I just want to go home. Um, and so she's like, fine, I'll take you home. And he's got like a kind of a Ted Bundy thing going on, and he's like really borderline creepy. Um, and he's taking her home, and as they're walking home, they get mugged. Uh, so he's like, yeah, my house is around here somewhere. And then they get mugged. And basically what happens is Eddie gets hit over the head with a bottle. He falls to the ground. Anne is like screaming her lungs off. Uh, this guy is like, you know, getting ready to assault her. And uh, and then she gets knocked down to the ground. And then as she's knocked out, Eddie gets up 
and he says look just take the girl take the girl and and leave me alone just take her and leave me alone like again despicable human being like you know they basically zeb wells is like i'm not going to hold anything back this guy is going to be to the point where you almost he's irredeemable almost you know and uh, and and that leads to him becoming a villain and that sets him on his journey of you know becoming an anti-hero so i really want to pave the way of him being kind of a, a low life and for me personally i don't know if i would have gone this far in the story as a writer um to push him to this level but i find it interesting that zeb wells did uh, because a lot of times people get afraid to make their characters this unlikable uh, because they they almost feel like they can't be redeemed but i think at this point in the comics they were trying to really push venom as a villain again uh, and actually at this point secret invasion was happening so Eddie Brock wasn't even Venom at this point. The suit went on to Matt Gargan. So I think this is them trying to get an Eddie Brock story in there and show like, hey, if he ever does get the symbiote back, he's going to be a bad guy. Like he's going to be a full on bad guy, um, which kind of did happen for a while. So after that, you know, Eddie is now is looking over at Anne. He's like, just take the girl, take the girl. And the criminal is getting ready to, you know, hurt Eddie. But then Spider-Man shows up and, and knocks out the bad guys um, and then webs away. He webs them up and then webs away. And the and Anne wakes up and she sees Eddie and the bad guys are gone. Or the, some of them are beat up and just left on the ground. Uh, the ones that are webbed up are like a little ways away because Spider-Man chased them. So she just wakes up and sees like a not, one knocked out guy and Eddie and he and she's like what did you do and he's like it was easy you know he's like i protected you so again that line coming back uh, full circle and uh, and then they start dating they move in together and he starts uh, applying to the daily um globe uh, which is an, a rival newspaper to the daily bugle and while there he's just like a copy boy but he's like trying to tell his wife like oh i'm i'm gonna get an article and yeah sometimes my articles get pushed don't worry I'll, I'll be on there i'll be on there and he's again lying to her um and just constantly lying to her and 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 just getting upset whenever she's like well when's it gonna happen you know he starts snapping at her and stuff and you know getting a little angry doesn't ever hit her he just just um, emotionally is just lying to her and just um you know leading her on making her think he's something more important than he is and uh, and so he goes and, and goes to work and the person he like works for, one of the journalists, decides not to take a story. Like they get an anonymous tip and the guy's like, all right, fine, I'm not gonna take a story. Uh, and so Eddie was like, fine, I'll do the story. Like on his own, he goes and tracks the source down and it coincidentally turns out to be the death of uh, Gene DeWolf that happened in the Spider-Man comics where the Sin Eater killed Gene DeWolf. And so now Eddie has stumbled across this storyline uh, and he has a, a, now a contact, someone who called in and said they were the killer and that they're going to kill again. So Eddie uses that and says, hey, look, we have a serial killer. I've seen patterns like this before. And they're like, who are you, kid? Aren't you the copy boy? And he's like, no, I'm a journalist. Like, I came here to be a journalist. And uh, I'm telling you, I've seen these patterns before. So when Sin Eater kills again... Eddie looks like he knows what he's talking about, uh, even though he already knew that information based off of this phone call. Uh, but as Eddie starts developing the story and writing about uh, the Sin Eater in the paper, the police start saying, you have to name your source. If you don't name your source, you're letting a serial killer continue to kill people. And the first victim was Gene DeWolf, a cop. So if you don't give us your source, um, we're going to arrest you. And he's like, I'm not giving up my source. So they arrest Eddie. And he goes through this whole rigmarole where he's trying to get out. He gets out, you know, on bail. His, he has a good lawyer. His lawyer's like, look, this guy is, he's he's doing a service. He's telling this criminal story, but he is not, you know, aiding this criminal. Uh, this criminal is chosen to be anonymous. And then after they do the the, the report or, you know, the, the news cameras and everyone goes away, the lawyer turns and goes, he is anonymous, right? You don't know his name because, uh, you know, I may be a scumbag lawyer, but I'm not that scumbaggy. Like people are dying. And Eddie's like, yep, I don't know his name, you know, and just playing up the lies again uh, but then he goes to work and people are really hounding him and then Anne starts hounding him and eventually he's like all right fine I'm going to give up my source I'm going to name the sin eater so that the police can arrest him and then I'll be the hero he does that but what happens is they find out that that guy is not the sin eater uh, the real sin eater is caught by spider-man and when he's unmasked it's revealed to be another cop a dirty cop uh, who you know Gene DeWolf started to stumble upon him and he was like killing her to keep her silent uh, and he was totally fine with letting this person in the newspaper take all the credit for the killings because it made him look like he wasn't the killer so uh, so after spider-man caught him and unmasked him it showed that Eddie was a fraud and that he actually has been lying this whole time and finally all the lies he's been telling his whole life have led him to this point where 
he was just, you know, busted basically and outed and exposed. Um, and so as he, you know, deals with that and, you know, leaves him, she wants the divorce paper signed. Um, and he goes to church and basically plans to kill himself. And uh, while at church is when the infamous moment happens where Spider-Man purges the black symbiote from himself and it rains down from above and lands on Eddie in the church and, uh, and turns his life around. And after that, you actually see from his point of view, he goes and he's like, the symbiote's talking to him and Eddie's like, I'm accepted. Someone's here with me. I'm not alone anymore. Someone who knows the truth about me and I don't have to lie to anymore. So Eddie finally found somebody. And then the symbiote who's been rejected by Spider-Man knows all about rejection and wasn't accepted either. So the two of them had this compatibility. And Eddie is like, all right, good. I don't need my wife anymore. I'm going to go sign those divorce papers. All right, goodbye, Anne, whatever. Um, and then he's like, all right, I'm going to go and continue to work out. He's pumping up. And then they show the scene where he pushes Peter Parker out in front of the, the subway train uh, to show that uh, that Venom doesn't set off Spider-Man's spider sense. So you see all those scenes again, everything that we saw in Birth of Venom, even to the point where the scene in uh, Birth of Venom, and I think it was Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man 299, when Mary Jane goes home, she comes home and she sees the black costume in the closet and it comes to life. And, uh, and she thinks it's all in her head. She thinks she's going crazy, uh, but she doesn't know it was actually Venom. So you get to see it from her point or his point of view in this scene. So in that comic in Birth of Venom, they show her get freaked out. And then the next issue is her crying and Peter comes home and he's like, what's wrong? And she's like, it's the suit. It's, you know, it's evil, it's evil. Um, and so that we don't know what happened in that gap. So this book shows you, it shows you, you know, Eddie Brock basically breaking Mary Jane down mentally. And he's just playing up that he's the symbiote. And he's like, I'm, uh, you know, the, I'm going to kill Peter. And she's translating it as he's not a real person. He's the suit talking to her. And she thinks she's losing her mind. And she's like, I know you're going to kill him. Like you're, Spider, Spider-Man's going to kill Peter Parker. Like he, him being Spider-Man will get him killed. And Eddie's like, yes, I'm going to rip his brains out and, you know, all the stuff. And she's seeing it as it's the suit you know it's what it represents of him being a superhero is going to kill him so she's having this total breakdown um which is really tragic to watch and eddie's just like being really malicious and uh, and just like laying spitting the venom laying it on her and just being like you know i'm going to kill him you know he's going to be dead you're going to be alone you know all this stuff so all the lines of dialogue that she said in amazing spider-man 300 uh, way back when and then birth of uh, birth of venom trade paperback she tells peter like that suit's going to kill you it's going to get it's going to be the death of you and uh and then that's why she goes and sews a new spider-man like a traditional spider-man costume so you see that she is uh you know what happened there what was the catalyst for that was so again zeb wells just knocking it out of the park by tying in previous continuity and adding new layers to it um, and then so after that, you just got the classic battle. You have Spider-Man and Venom. Spider-Man's in the black costume and Venom's in obviously the symbiote uh, because after Spider-Man got rid of the, the symbiote, he still had a sewn black costume, like one that was sewn together for him. Um, so that's what he was rocking. So it's the black Spider-Man, black costume Spider-Man versus Venom. And they're just battling it out, going, you know, beating the crap out of each other. And Zeb Wells and Angel Medina completely reimagine that fight from Amazing Spider-Man 300 without like, crapping on it at all like they don't they don't discard or anything that Todd McFarlane and David Michelini did they do it all again in a new way under a new light you know with different angles and it's like watching a remake it's like taking one of your favorite scenes from a movie and remaking it and it's just really done really really well um, and then of course it ends with uh, with Eddie getting defeated by Spider-Man and captured by the Fantastic Four and put in the tube and once again, uh, Eddie says, as he's narrating at the end, he says, you know, the suit tells me it loves me and it wants me, and I choose to believe it uh, because that's easy, even though he knows secretly the suit just wants to come back to Spider-Man and wants to reunite with Spider-Man. So again, Eddie feeling uh, rejected once again at the end of the story. So it's, it's a really... Uh, like moving and powerful journey, I think. And I think Zeb Wells did an amazing job. And and this trade paperback, I don't know if it's in print right now. I, I know you can buy it digitally for sure on Kindle and Comixology, but I don't know if it's in print right now. Uh, I hope they reprint it. That would be a great uh, companion to the movie if this got reprinted, even though the movie's probably not going to be based on any of this. Um, hopefully the sequel will be if they make a sequel. But I thought this was a really great story. And if you're out there and you want the origin of Venom, the origin of Eddie Brock, um, pick up Birth of Venom and pick up Dark Origin. I'm telling you, these two together complement each other so well. 
you're going to love it. It's a great time. And before we end this episode, I do want to remind you guys that Carnage Week is starting right now. I'm recording this after I've already recorded the first three Carnage Week episodes. Actually, the first episode right now just finished exporting. So that is going to, I'm going to post this and then post that right after. So you're going to get two episodes today, one Venom vlog, one Carnage Week. And then I'll try to get at least one more Carnage Week up tomorrow. Uh, but my times of uploading are going to be different than they normally are. My schedule got thrown off this weekend. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm off today. I'm going to try to do as much as I can today. Uh, but I also have to stream today and I have to get some writing in today. So it's 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 a little tough for me schedule-wise. But I'm going to try to stick to at least once a day. But they may not always be uploaded in the morning like they have been uh, over the you know the past couple weeks. Uh, um, they may get uploaded late at night, in the middle of the afternoon. I don't know. I'm going to do the best I can. But just know that every day... I'm going to at least get one Carnage Week video up to you guys. And if any movie news pops up, obviously we'll do an emergency episode for that one. No problem. Uh, but uh, but otherwise, it's just going to be Carnage all week long. Because I'm anticipating a slow news week. Uh, but if we get surprised, hey, that's good too. So thank you guys, as always, for watching. Let me know down in the comments below what you think of this uh, the storyline. If you have any questions about it, I can answer them down below. And if you've read it yourself, let me know some of your favorite parts in it. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. I'll see you in the future. Peace.